Hi, I'm Michael Cortese of Noble Spirit in Pittsfield, New Hampshire. And I'm Charles Epting of HR Harmer in New York City. And this is Stanley Gibbons Stamp Catalog, Past, Present, and Future with Hugh Jeffries. Hugh Jeffries joined Stanley Gibbons in 1975 and soon after, in 1988, became the editor of Gibbons Stamp Monthly. He then became the editor of Stanley Gibbons Catalog in 2003. He has since retired as editor of the magazine but continues as editor of the Part 1 Catalog and in 2015 was made a member of the Order of the British Empire for services to philately. In this talk, he traces the development of the catalog since its first edition in 1865, explains how it has adapted to meet the changing needs of collectors, the challenges of new technology, and the issuing policies of the world's postal administrations. He discusses the work which goes into each volume and invites everyone to contribute to future editions to ensure that it remains the best guide to our hobby available. So without further ado, Hugh, we'll hand it over to you and uh, very much looking forward to this talk. Thanks very much, Michael and Charles. Very kind of you. Where am I? I'll start anyway. Uh, I think probably you, you've heard about my career at Stanley Gibbons, but perhaps the most important thing, or I think is the most important thing, is that I've been collecting stamps for a very, very long time. And in fact, from, well, more than 60 years now, I've been collecting the stamps of Great Britain and the British Commonwealth. The idea, remembering back to when I started collecting that, was that when I grew up, I would start collecting something sensible, maybe a smaller area. But unfortunately, growing up has somehow eluded me. So the fact remains that if, if it's something that's still in part one, then I collect it. And if you're not sure what part one means, I'll come to that later. Anyway, enough about me. Um, the sub subject here is the Stanley Gibbons catalogue. And I think the first thing I must uh, dispel, dispel is the myth that he was the first person to publish a stamp catalogue. That actually was done by Jean-Baptiste Baptiste Moens in France in 1861. And he produced a very erudite tome which ran through several editions. And he actually published an edition in English in 1863, of which I'm pleased to say I have a copy here. Uh, he, Stanley Gibbons wasn't even the first person to publish a catalogue in the UK. Uh, a Dr. Gray produced a catalogue and there was also a Mount Brown catalogue. The Mount Brown catalogue I have here, this is the second edition, and this was published in 1863 well before Stanley Gibbons first. So he wasn't the first, but he did take a new slant on it. And the reason was that situated in Plymouth, Stanley Gibbons was well positioned to acquire stock of stamps. We all know the story about the two sailors and the kit bag full of Cape Triangulars, but he must have had connections with the naval banks and chandleries and uniform outfitters. In fact, all sorts of business that used to, businesses that used to deal with naval officers stationed all around the world. So he didn't have any trouble acquiring stock, but being way away from London, the center of the stamp world, he, did, he found it quite difficult to sell any of it. Most of his uh, business was um, carried out with correspondence, and we have copies of his, a copy of his correspondence book in which he copied down every letter that he sent out. So the letter usually started, it, most of them were to other members of the trade, and the first letter would be offering them items for stock. The second letter would be accompanying the stock that had been ordered, and the third letter, a couple of months later, would be demanding payment. So good to know that some things in philately haven't changed in 150 years. Anyway, um, his idea then was to produce a printed price list. The Mount Brown catalogue that I showed you earlier, this little thing, 
that cost a shilling. And the Merns catalogue, obviously substantially more. Stanley Gibbons produced his for a penny, or oddly, post free for tuppence. I never could quite understand that. Um, however, he produced the first edition in November 1865, and it was essentially a monthly price list. Unfortunately, I don't have one to show you because there are only two and they're both in institutional collections. But um, a, a, a facsimile of it was produced as part of our catalogue centenary exhibition in London in 1865. And it makes fascinating reading. Uh, a penny black was a penny and half a dozen would cost you sixpence. These were unused, of course, uh, used ones, of course. Um, and the catalogue produced continued as a monthly product for several years until in 1874, he finally realized that perhaps Plymouth wasn't the best place to be running his business. And he moved to London, eventually settling in Gower Street near uh, Euston, where he continued to edit the catalogue personally, as well as dealing with all his day-to-day -day correspondence. The catalogue gradually expanded. Obviously, there were a lot of new issues coming out all the time. And by 1888, looked something like this, with illustrations in the back and the listings and prices in the front. By the time of this one, a penny black would cost you tuppence and a dozen one and sixpence. So uh, prices had moved a little bit. Um, in 1890, Stanley Gibbons sold the company to Charles Phillips and he clearly had clear ideas about what he wanted to do with the catalog because he took over the editorship and started making changes big time. One of the key things was putting the illustrations in with the listings. Um, now, another problem with the Stanley Gibbons catalog, um, he did introduce a numbering system, but it ran from one with the first stamps of Alwa and ran through from there. So, Say the last stamp of Canada was Stanley Gibbons number 220, then the first stamp of Cape of Good Hope would be number 221. When I think of the amount of grief I get from collectors when a single number is changed in the catalogue these days, I wonder just how they would have coped with it then. However, Stanley Phillips decided this was no sensible way of doing things, and each country now started at one. So that was one good move. The catalogue there continued to grow though, and although he continued to produce a Stamps of the World, which was a fairly solid volume that contained every country, he also split the catalogue up into parts. Part one, British Empire, and it's still called part one to this day. This is the 1900 edition, and as you can see, changed from the much larger uh, size to something that could be conveniently carried around in your pocket. This was a genius stroke because sales uh, absolutely went through the roof once these came out. Uh, part two covered foreign countries. Part three, postal stationery. Part three, unfortunately, did not last all that much longer, but parts one and two carried on. Also in the early 20th century, an important uh, change in policy came in up until that time, the catalogue had been purely a price list. So if at the time he had a copy of a Canada 12 pence black in stock, then 
the stamp would carry a price. But if he'd sold it, then there would be a blank in the catalogue. And that made it much less of a useful reference. So from about First World War times, um, the company introduced what I suppose would be described as virtual prices. So the price came what the stamp would cost if it were in stock. And obviously, as issuing policies go on and on and on expanding, there's no way that we can carry everything like the um, entire catalog in stock at any one time. And so uh, virtual prices have remained ever since. Now we'll discuss a little bit more about pricing a little bit later on, if I can. Now moving on, um, in the 1920s and 30s, different fads and crazes came and went. A catalogue was produced for war stamps. In the 1930s, a catalogue for airmails came out. Uh, that also only ran for two or three editions. Um, after the war, the foreign catalogue was split into two parts. So European colonies was part two and the rest of the world called America, Asia and Africa became part three. Up until 1970 that was when an attempt was made to what we called sectionalize the catalog and produce more of a one country um, range from the foreign section. So there would be a catalog for Italy and a catalog for France. Um, the market didn't seem to be ready for that, that, that then, so, and they didn't sell very well. So we had to go back to parts two and three, then tried again with the sectionals in 1980, and that time it seemed to work. And so from then on, up until a couple of years ago, we had parts two to 22 covering the foreign countries. Now we're in the process of splitting those parts up because most of them become unmanageably large. And um, that process is ongoing at the moment. Uh, other introductions, um, it's a key thing about being a catalog publisher. You need to be fairly nimble. And um, if collecting tastes change, you have to try and adjust to meet those tastes. Um, obviously, specialization became much more of a big thing in the 50s and 60s and has continued ever since. Uh, we produced the first edition of the Great Britain Specialized Catalog in 1960. And that had proved, proved a great success. And just recently produced the latest volume of the Specialized Catalog with the help of the Great Britain Philatelic Society. And that has, um, I suppose, received raised reviews is probably the, um, the best way of putting it. The catalogues as well have expanded and um, developed to meet those changing tastes of philatelists. So there are, for example, more varieties now than there used to be. We are increasing the amount of used abroad sections. Um, telegraph stamps were added to part one uh, about five years ago. Each, tar each edition, uh, we aim to produce something new to appeal to the collector. Other developments, of course, have been uh, the move to color. This happened in 2003. And the year before that, we produced the last edition of the total part one British Empire catalogue all in one go. Now the catalogue only goes up to 1970 and is still a pretty hefty tome. But uh, after that, for the post 1970 issues, there are se separate catalogues covering areas such as the Leeward Islands and Canada and Australia. Uh, and they amount to another 20 or so volumes which come out periodically. So that's more or less the history of the catalogue. 
a little bit now on how the catalogue is produced. And there are, I suppose, three main processes involved here. The first one is the keeping up to date with new issues. Now, I don't need to tell you that most of the world's postal administrations are continuing to increase the number of stamps they issue almost exponentially. And as a collector, you are perfectly entitled to say, I've had enough, I'm not going to buy any more of these. But as a catalogue publisher, we have to live with it. And we have to acquire all of these stamps in order to study them carefully. Every stamp issued needs to be inspected uh, in order to produce an accurate listing with face value, description, colors, print method, hopefully designer, uh, the actual um, what is what is depicted, um, the perforation, the watermark, if there is one, every aspect needs to be carefully checked and annotated in the catalogue supplement. Um, unfortunately, we have learnt through, um, well, I wouldn't say long experience, it doesn't take very long to realise that the information coming out of post offices is very often not very accurate. So every stamp needs to be acquired. And as I say, there are an awful lot of them and it's quite an expensive process, but we have to do it. Um, now there are other problems, of course, apart from the, um, the sheer number produced. Um, there are some post offices who make no habit, no, no bones about the fact that they produce one set of, one group of stamps for their collector customers and another set of stamps for people to stick on letters. And they don't tell the philatelic world about the stamps which are for people to stick on letters because either they think we wouldn't be interested in them or they don't want those collectors finding out about them, otherwise there won't be any left for people to stick on letters. I think there's probably a mixture of both in there. Anyway, we don't find out about these until one st starts turning up on, on the mail and then somebody sends me a, a, an email with a scan saying, I don't know what this stamp is, what is it? My immediate reaction is, I don't know what it is either. But then we have to find out, and it may have been issued four years previously, and we have to find out if it was a single stamp or part of a set. And it's all part of the fun, I suppose. Other countries are producing ever larger number of stamps and decisions have to be made about whether they should or should not be listed. And maybe that's another area I can come on to um, if there's time. Uh, the second part of the job is updating the existing uh, catalogue, and that I have to admit is the, the bit that I enjoy most because that's what I collect. Um, so uh, this involves monitoring all the specialist society journals to um, keep our eye on new discoveries, reviewing the major auction catalogues, and um, and, and the society auctions as well, to make sure that we are up to date with the latest research into everything. Um, if somebody, for example, discovers a stamp that was used on the 15th of September, 1871, and the catalog says that it was issued on the 16th, then we like to know about it because that information needs to be accurate. So, I plea to anybody who finds some information that they think renders the catalogue inaccurate or plain wrong, let me know and um, we'll see what we can do about it. Now, of course, there are limits to what we can do. We could spend, I don't know, 25 days a week checking all the chat rooms, 
all the um, internet auction sites, um, everything, all the minor auction houses all over the world for information that might impact on the catalog. There is a limit, we can't do it all. So we are very grateful for, to those collectors and uh, a number of dealers and societies who assist us with up-to-date information. So if you are doing research into the 1871 issue of Venezuela and have um, information which could assist other collectors via the catalogue, then we are always keen to hear from you. Now, um, I do understand that there is an element of, if you've got a piece of information, you want to keep it to yourself. And I have certainly been to uh, society displays where the speaker has said, I've got this stamp that Stanley Gibbons doesn't know about. For goodness sake, don't tell them. Um, so I'm always very keen to look at that particular item um, as he's obviously unaware that I'm the catalog editor. Anyway, um, enough of that. Uh, we do, however, uh, fortunately have a lot of societies which are very helpful and I would particularly like at the moment to commend the Great Britain Philatelic Society for all the assistance which they gave us with this job. Um, which, as I say, has been very well rece received and as much credit goes to the society as it does to the publisher. Um, so I repeat, if you have anything which you feel you would like to impart, then please do so. Now then, the other, th the third aspect of the catalogue, of course, is pricing a possibly uh, slightly contentious area. Um, I think we've probably all been brought up on the story of Stanley Gibbons prices are much too high. Um, they, own, they price high everything they've got to sell and they mark down everything that they want to buy. Well, it's a nice story, but um, I don't suppose it was ever true. It certainly hasn't been true for the last 50 years. Um, and the other thing, of course, is the uh, large number of collectors who say, well, I'd never pay more than half catalogue for anything. I think we've probably all been through that stage at one point or other in our collecting career. But let's face it, um, we are in business to sell stamps. The catalogue is our price list. If the prices were as high as some people seem to say they are, then we'd never sell anything and we'd rapidly go out of business. Um, if they were too low, uh, we would sell everything very quickly and we wouldn't be able to replace it because all other dealers or the majority of other dealers price their stocks according to the price in the catalogue. So we wouldn't be able to replace anything. And again, we'd swiftly be out of business. It is therefore very important that the prices in the catalogue are as accurate as they can possibly be. And each year, um, or not each year, but every catalogue that is produced has the prices checked from beginning to end. Uh, and checking is done in a number of ways. Um, we obviously are aware of our own stock levels, of our own sales. Um, other dealers very kindly help us with information concerning their stock levels and sales. Uh, we keep an eye on most of the major auction houses. So if a stamps catalogued at 300 quid and one sells at an auction for 400, then possibly the price needs to go up. Um, dealers and indeed collectors are also very helpful. Um, now, you know, I wouldn't expect you to say, think, oh, I want a copy of this stamp. I've been looking for it for 20 years. Um, 
Stanley Gibbons says it's only worth eight quid, but clearly it must be worth more than that. Otherwise, I'd, found, I'd have found lots of them. Now, you're not going to come to me and say, look, this stamp's too cheap before you've bought it, are you? I mean, I'm not silly, and I know you're not as well. So we are interested. Maybe once you've bought it, let us know, um, and then we can have a look at the price. But we won't always agree. Um, there was a, an article in a specialist society journal, I don't know, um, 10 years ago or so, where somebody was saying, I've been searching for this stamp for 20 years. It's only priced at eight quid. It's clearly far too cheap. Um, the price is too low. So I contacted the shop at the Strand and I said, I think the price is too low. And they said, well, we don't agree. We've got 10 of them in stock and we haven't sold one for three years. We were thinking of marking the price down. So I suppose the message there is if there's something you've not been looking for, why not try Stanley Gibbons before you get too desperate? Anyway, uh, the prices are checked very carefully, as I say, and um, are altered or reviewed at least with every edition of every catalogue published. Um, but, uh, you know, we are always willing to listen to anybody who has thoughts about whether they might be right or wrong or... Um, anyway, we welcome contact. Um, so, that is the catalogue as it is produced now. How about the future? Well, um, collecting is changing all the time, as you know. I've already mentioned the problem that we have. We have generally a range of, of uh, comprehensive catalogues of, of a general nature. So you've got British Empire, you've got Canada, Australia, France, but uh, as time goes on, collecting is becoming more and more specialised. Now, you're not going to want to buy a 90 quid catalogue that only contains five pages that you're interested in. Well, maybe not interested in, but five pages that is relevant to you, that are relevant to your own collection. On the other hand, it's hardly going to be worth our while to produce a catalogue which contains only five pages of listings because it'll have about 30 pages of introduction and index. And um, so you're not really going to get your money's worth there. Happily, the digital format is now here and offers the opportunity for us to create the catalogue that everybody wants. Now, for some years, uh, we have been able to offer most of our catalogues uh, through an app store. And so you can, at the moment, carry a fully searchable part one or Great Britain Concise catalogue on your a tablet or your laptop, and that works fine, but they do still mirror the published catalogue. If, for example, you only wanted the Cayman Islands section of part one, then that is not yet available. But it should be, because it exists in a digital format, and hopefully in the not too distant future, you will be able to pick and choose those parts of the catalogue that you're looking for. Another opportunity would be to expand the new issue sections. So the catalogue supplement appears every month in Gibbon Stamp Monthly, but its size is limited because every page of the supplement is backed by advertising. Its size is limited by the amount of advertising the magazine can carry. Um, so that may mean the catalogue supplement will only be 12, 14, 15 pages. 
Um, and then everything else has to get pushed forward into the following month's issue. And that this is with not illustrating every stamp. If we produced a digital supplement, then we could probably illustrate every stamp and have a 25 page supplement online, uh, even though the Gibbon Stamp Monthly Supplement, albeit complete and carrying all the right information, um, might not carry all the, all the um, illustrations because your need is to see the catalogue supplement fast as well as accurate. Now, our need, of course, is that it should be accurate. Um, we appreciate the, uh, the desire to have it fast, but as I said earlier, every stamp needs to be acquired and carefully studied and annotated before it can go into the catalogue. Um, and uh, so the two need to meld together so that we can produce an accurate catalogue as quickly as you would desire to have it. Um, so all this talk about um, digital catalogues um, must bring the, um, the great worry that I know many collectors would have, or I would certainly have it, because you know, looking at things online is all very well, but what you really want is the book, isn't it? Uh, and my feeling is that the book is here to stay. Um, and so you should have no fears that um, the printed catalogue will go. Um, the, um, one of the developments I forgot about in the history was in 1935, we introduced the simplified catalogue which was a dumpy little orange volume listing in simplified form all the stamps of the entire world, not listing things like watermarks and perforations, just every design and colour difference. Um, that dumpy little volume is now a six volume monster, which we call stamps of the world, but it is still uh, purchased readily by a large number of collectors every year is still a viable product and as long as people want to buy a catalogue we will continue to produce them. Um, however online um, definitely um, is, will be the future to a great degree. Now, obviously, we haven't been in catalogue publishing for 160 years or so without being aware of what collectors want. And so continuing developments will be made both editorially and in the um, format of the catalogue that's um, that we can supply. And any help that you are able to give us would be welcome. And the other thing is, um, when I was shortly after I became catalog editor, I went to a, uh, I went to one of the most well known societies in the country, in the world, probably, and was surprised and a bit upset to find the queue of collectors who were photocopying the pages from the catalogue that I had just lovingly seen to press and thinking, well, we're not getting much benefit out of that, are we? Now, I can understand that. And in a way, the digital product should help because I can understand that, you know, you don't want to buy 500 pages when you only need five. But at the same time, I think the catalogue is an important guide to all collectors, new collectors, as well as experienced ones. And so it is quite important that it remains economically viable. So if you're ever tempted to take a photocopy, please don't go out and buy the catalogue.
Thank you. Now, there are one or two things that I skimmed past while I was giving the talk in case I have time, and it seems as though I have got a little bit more time, so that's good. Now, um, one of the um, issues is the new issues and how many and in how much detail they should be listed. Now, I know, as I said before, that most commemorative and special issues aren't really produced these days for postal use. They're produced for us collectors. Now, back in the 1960s, when, yeah, there were a few commemoratives, but you no, know, nothing too unreasonable, and they were always relevant to the country concerned and quite nicely designed and produced. Um, but one or two countries started going over the top. And so we produced a um, something in our catalogue called the appendix. And this was for stamp issues that we considered to be unnecessary. And I'm just trying to look. Ah, yes, here we are. Uh, stamps issued in excess of postal needs or not made available to the public in reasonable quantities. That was the phrase devised in 1966 by the then catalogue editor. And any stamp that didn't meet those criteria was consigned to the appendix. Well, 50 years further down the line, nearly every stamp that's issued would have to go into the appendix if we still stuck to those criteria. So it is sometimes difficult. I, I do um, hold the belief that it's up to every collector to collect what they want. And the catalogue should list everything or list as much as possible so the collector can make that decision. But at the same time, if there are so many issues that the catalogue gets larger and larger and larger, and of course, more expensive and more expensive and more expensive, then that makes it difficult for all the other collectors who want to buy it. So somehow a decision has to be made. Do you list everything or don't you list everything? And how do you decide what gets listed and what doesn't? Well, in most cases, we do confine ourselves to stamps that are sold at face value. So um, if a stamp is pro sold at a premium, unless it's a charity premium or in support of a philatelic exhibition, then they won't get listed. So a lot of the um, uh, premium booklets and things or stamps from premium booklets do not get listed. But we try to um, tread a medium line so that we can produce the catalogue that is of maximum value to collectors without, um, uh, without making the catalogue so huge that it would be inaccessibly expensive. However, um, no doubt everybody would have their views and we do receive those views. But of course, for every view pro, you get one uh, against. Um, now, another issue which, um, which uh, comes to mind is concerns level of specialization. The standard catalogues are becoming more and more specialized to meet the needs of existing collectors. So um, stamps of India used in Aden, for example, this was an area that this was a subsec a section of the catalog that was added a couple of years ago. Uh, uh, to much, uh, much rejoicing in certain quarters, I should say. Um, but it does produce something that you know, maybe every collector isn't interested in. 
So again, we have to carefully consider uh, whether we are going too far with our levels of specialization or not far enough. And each year, somebody will send me, well, many people will send in suggestions for how a listing may be improved and enhanced based on research they've been doing into the, I don't know, 1873 issue of Grenada, um, where they would like to see some more shades and some different papers and um, one or two varieties added because that's what they're interested in. And I have to say, I have a lot of sympathy with that. Being a collector of everything in part one, I also collect Grenada. So, um, you know, I love to know about that sort of thing. However, I have to also think of those people who are not particularly interested in Grenada. Um, they just want a catalog that will give them a general overview of everything issued by the British Commonwealth over the past 130 years. And um, so again, it's a matter of a bit of a tightrope, but what I would say is send me your thoughts. Uh, we are always interested in hearing from you. If you've got an idea about how the catalog could be improved and enhanced, let me know. Um, if there's a problem, something that you think uh, you know, is not done, being done quite properly enough, then let me know about that as well. We won't always agree, as I've said. Um, we have a certain amount of expertise and experience on hand. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm not promising that every suggestion will be taken up, but if you don't make the suggestion in the first place, it never can be, can it? So I think we're now coming to the end of the, uh, the talk itself. Thank you very much for listening, and um, I hope it hasn't been too boring. Uh, and uh, if there are any questions, fire away. We've got some great questions lined up here in the uh, in, in the chats. Can you guys hear me okay? Perfect. So, so one, one question that we've gotten from a couple of people, you said something very early on that I think struck a chord. Uh, you talked about this volume three that was postal stationary uh, of the world. And, uh, you know, as, as far as I know, nobody's really tried to tackle that since the Higgins and Gage catalog back in the uh, 80s or so. So is, is that something that, uh, that, that Gibbons would ever consider revisiting, uh, a, 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 even a British Commonwealth postal stationery catalog? I think it would be considered, yes. But I mean, the reason it was dispensed with in the first place was I am sure that it wasn't selling in sufficient volume to um, make it economically viable. Uh, when a new volume is, um, when a new catalogue is produced, that obviously requires a lot of extra work. Uh, I think for a launch volume, I don't know, what, one of the great bonuses about being retired and just having to edit the catalogue now is that I don't have to worry about targets and budgets and all that sort of nonsense. Uh, not nonsense, of course, it's all very serious and important. Um, so. I don't know how many we would need to sell in order to make it viable. But although I do appreciate, uh, obviously reading the society journals, there is a, a huge amount of interest in postal stationery. But whether we would get the sales volumes, I'm afraid I'm not so sure. Happily, it wouldn't be me that would make that decision. But if, um, you know, anybody's got any thoughts and, uh, you know, is prepared to do the donkey work, um, who knows, um, we can always talk about it. But it's, that I think would be the problem. Great. Uh, another question we got, uh, Hugh, was someone was asking what criteria does a stamp have to meet before it's included in the catalog? Uh, more reverse the, of that question is why aren't some stamps included in the catalog specialized in general, for example, certain shades, 
cylinder blocks or perforation types? Right. Well, the catalog, uh, the main Stanley Gibbons catalog only issue only lists individual stamps. So um, cylinder blocks and uh, sh other sheet formats would not be relevant to the main catalogue, although they are listed in the Great Britain specialised catalogue for GB only. Um, the basic criteria is that a stamp has to be available at face value from post offices. Um, now the at face value, that's reasonably okay. You know, any stamp that's sold at a premium may not be may not be listed. It also has to be uh, reasonably available. So um, if, uh, if there are blocked values, for example, in a set that used to be a bit of a, a thing in Eastern Europe in the 1950s, then those would probably not be listed. So availability, availability at the price that it says on the stamp, um, those will be the two main criteria. Of course, they also have to be valid for postage. And um, I think that's about it. If, if, if you start spreading it to shades and more specialized areas, uh, some of those are listed. A shade, for example, um, would need to be quite distinct. Um, and it would be best if it was related to a particular printing or uh, a particular issue of a value. So if the 1875 stamp was green and then they bought out a new printing two years later in a dark green, then that would probably merit listing. But if there were lots of shades in between, then that would make it more difficult. So. We listen and, you know, if you've got suggestions, I mean, new shades are being added every year, um, but uh, not too many of them. But, you know, let us know if you've got something in mind. OK. I'm muted. I'm going to combine a couple of questions into one. Somebody was asking about new thematic catalogs. Somebody was asking about a new Elizabethan era catalog since it's been uh, a couple of years since a, a specialized Elizabethan catalog. How do you balance? What, what is the philosophy where you're, you're trying to appeal to a lot of different demographics? And you touched on this a little bit with the, uh, the 1935 uh, simplified catalog and th that is still in print today. So, you know, you, you have people who want the plating. They want the uh, watermark varieties. They want the the details of the of the Victorian era stuff, and then you have people who want motor vehicles on stamps or mansions. How do you balance these different audiences? What what do you look for when you're trying to figure out what needs updating next? What the the next project to tackle will be? How do you try and serve so many different masters? Yeah, well, that is that 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 is a problem. Um, obviously, um, the viability is is the key thing. I mean, we produced our first thematic catalogue in 1983, Collect Birds on Stamps, and it was very well received. But I have to say that a thematic catalogue requires a great deal more work than a basic philatelic catalogue. You know, we're not um, experts on birds, aircraft or ships, and, but we want our catalogue to be accurate. So I, I remember um, long discussions. We've had various people who've helped us with our collect aircraft on catalog, aircraft on stamps catalog, for example. And um, you know the debates as to whether a particular aircraft was actually the Mark III or the Mark III-A um, could go on for decades. And probably the designer didn't really care, it was just something he made up. So, you know, accuracy in those terms is difficult. Now we haven't produced a thematic catalog for, I think probably over 10 years with the last edition of the Collect Aircraft, um, but we are not, we haven't given up the idea. 
It's just that they are um, not quite as much in demand as the traditional country catalogues. And, you know, if we have limited resources, which unfortunately we do, then those resources are going to get directed towards um, the catalogues which we know can sell. Um, but I think, again, coming back to the, the digital um, opportunities, um, there would be, for example, an opportunity to key into every stamp description a tag that says this stamp includes a dinosaur or an aeroplane or a ship or maybe even a penguin or a frigate or something like that so that um, we wouldn't need to worry so much about publishing thematic catalogues anymore. People would be able to um, seek what they wanted in the all world digital catalog and um, find exactly what they're looking for. Um, I can't remember what was the, was thematics and something else. Oh, it was levels and specialization. Yeah, and, and, and the, the more modern material versus the... Um, versus the, the, the yeah. yeah. Um, okay, well, the last Elizabethan was produced in 1983 or 1984. I can't remember. Um, I was there for it anyway. <laughs> um, and unfortunately, although it was a big selling catalogue when we launched it, interest was declining fairly uh, steadily. And it just wasn't, um, it wasn't viable to go on producing it in the, in the same way. But I still have my 1983 volume, you know, right at my side in my study. And I refer to it almost daily, although it is getting pretty tatty now. Um, and it does occur to me that um, it might be quite a nice idea to produce a new edition. But it wouldn't be possible to update it, I don't think. When we were producing the catalogue, for example, we kept lists of every, every new printing um, and their dates, um, uh, every plate that was used to print a particular stamp was all noted, uh, so it could be used in the, um, in the forthcoming Elizabethan. When we stopped producing the Elizabethan, we stopped logging that information because we didn't require it anymore. So um, we would not be able to produce the level of detail on Elizabethan catalogue with issues from the 21st century. It might be possible to redo the 1983 edition, um, but whether that would be a useful um, volume for anybody, I'm not quite sure. Um, as I say, I find it very handy to have, but um, we'd need another 5,000 other people to be equally enthusiastic, I think. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yeah, I, I love that idea of the, the thematic search and the digital uh, catalog. We, we have a question here, uh, Hugh. Bogus, false, and unnecessary stamps. About how many stamps produced for your for collectors do you estimate that you don't list in the Gibbons catalog Elvis series of Rwanda sort of thing uh do you know I wish I had the time to even learn about that um my only my only knowledge well apart from the fact that I know that they exist uh is the fact that if somebody says to me um I've got this stamp from this country, which you don't list. And generally speaking, you can take a look at it and say, that's bogus. Uh, but if there's any doubt, you can contact the uh, Postal Administration and Concerned. And in 50% of occasions within the next six months, you may get a reply and they will usually say, um, that's bogus. There is um, supposed to be a, um, a database of um, stamps held by the UPU of all issued 
um, stamps, and this was certainly a, a valuable reference some years ago. Um, I must admit that now I'm retired, so to speak, um, I don't keep an eye on that as, as, as regularly as I probably should. Um, but I fear that there are large numbers of bogus stamps being produced, um, and each stamp, when it comes up for listing in the catalogue, because we mainly obtain our stamps from postal administrations, um, we don't usually have that problem. The problem is more, is this postal administration producing a stamp that we really ought to list or not? But it's a problem. Sorry, can't help that. I think this is an interesting question. Somebody asked, can you tell us about a case where a stamp's catalog price went up or down very sharply due to some interesting reason? Is there a, an anecdote you have about when you had to adjust <coughs> the price because of some extenuating circumstance? Okay, well, there's one that um, I had to email somebody about quite recently, so it comes to mind. Uh, there was a stamp from the Pakistan state of Bahawalpa which we had priced at, if I remember, something like 40 pounds. So it's quite a desirable stamp. Um, and then one day somebody came into our auction office um, with a parcel of complete sheets about an inch thick, which had clearly just appeared from a, a vault somewhere. And so we had little alternative but to reduce the price from 40 pounds to 50 pence in one go. And I used that as a, as, as a bit of a selling tool with, with that year's catalog, because if you're one of those people who likes to hang on to their catalogue for five years and not buy a new one, which, you know, some of us are a bit like that, aren't we? Um, you could have gone to a dealer and spent 20 or 30 quid on this stamp when it was only catalogued at 50 pence. Uh, likewise, price increases, they tend to be more um, in relation to auction realizations. So there may be a very rare stamp which only comes up onto the market once every 20 years or so. And um, so it's got a price. You set the price according to its real sale realization back in 1985, and it comes up for sale again. You've probably been marking it up slowly in the meantime, but maybe, but you know, there's an element of guesswork, isn't there? Um, educated guesswork, I would like to say, but nevertheless, you have to estimate what its value might be. Comes up in auction, two people want it, price goes through the roof. Well, you don't really have too much choice. If, if the stamp fetched 10,000 pounds at auction, then you have to put the catalog price somewhere around there, don't you? So, yeah, but I like the, I, I, I like the Bahawalpa stamp. I think that's a good story. Well, fantastic. I think that's all the time we have here, but I, I believe if anyone else has uh, any additional questions, they can join us at the Conversations with Philatelists booth uh, in a couple of minutes. Uh, Hugh, if you uh, have a, a little bit more time to maybe answer any yeah, last yeah, minute happy questions, to. if you wouldn't yeah. mind joining us. That'd be no perfect. problem. Thank you so much, Hugh. This has been, uh, this has been incredible. Uh, my, my pleasure. I'm, I'm, I hope it was um, interesting and informative and not too boring. <laughs> oh, I, 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 I personally enjoyed it very much. And, and again, thank you to everyone who uh, participated as well. Thank you for all the great questions. And, uh, and, and again, Hugh, most of all, thank you uh, for, for you taking the time to, to entertain us all. My pleasure.